All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Quarantine Coffee Hour. Uh, I'm your host, Derek Pratt. Uh, sorry you can't see me today, folks. We're trying out a new thing where I, you know, show you a PowerPoint. You don't have to stare at my face the whole time. I assure you I'm here. I'm not just this disembodied picture of Oliver Wendell Petrie's head, who we will be talking about on today's program. Uh, once again, this is Derek Pratt, the educator at the Erie Canal Museum. I assure you, I have on a lovely Hawaiian shirt and am continuing to drink recessed coffee, as always. Sadly, you can't see my mug today like we usually have. This one says, I love cheese. Uh, dairy, of course, being the official food of the great state of New York, uh, the Empire State. And that will come up later later in this episode. Um, remember, uh, buy local folks in this time of need. And, as always, support your local cultural institutions, like the Erie Canal Museum. Uh, we're going to give people a couple min a couple seconds still to, to get on, to start watching the broadcast. Then we'll start. Uh, I believe we're going to have some, some special guests uh, watching today. Um, the, the daughter of Oliver Petrie and possibly his, his grandchildren. Uh, so that is awesome. Um, so, uh, as always, please say hi in the comments and where you're watching from. Uh, and without further ado, we've got a, a decent crowd here. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll get started. Let's, let's talk about Oliver Wendell Petrie shall we um so this is oliver you can see his picture here hello beth hi al um oliver uh why why are we talking about oliver today um for a lot of reasons i think uh us everybody on the erie canal we look a bit too closely sometimes we get focused on the towpath era canal in the 1800s which justly so, that was uh, an incredibly important thing. Hi from everyone else, we've got Oswego Expeditions, uh, Lynn from Syracuse, Dennis Reed out in Buffalo, Cynthia Pecklick, my mom. Hi mom, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, anyway, uh, Oliver's an interesting case here uh, on the Barge Canal. Uh, we don't usually look at the 1930s on the Erie Canal, but it was still a, a booming and vibrant waterway. And uh, Oliver's story really helps to show that. And we luckily know a lot about him because his family uh, generously in 2013 donated many of his personal effects from his time on the canals, including six letters uh, his union booklet, uh, his, his card for traveling on uh, American waterways, his discharge book, and I think the coolest thing we have in our in our collection of Oliver's is his recipe book. Uh, also, hello to everybody else that came in. We got some people watching in Kentucky. That's exciting. Um, so we got these recipe books. I also would like to give a special shout out to his youngest daughter, Lois, who I was lucky enough to talk to on the phone in March uh, and get a lot more information about Oliver than what we can already glean from his letters and recipe books and everything. So let's start looking at the life of Mr. Oliver Petrie. Here's a few other... Uh, pictures of things that we have of his. We've got his discharge book. Uh, you can see he took four voyages on the the canals, which we're going to talk about uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, and here are some of his letters. Uh, this is one from 1939 that he wrote. Uh, but let's talk a little about 
the guy who wrote these letters and who wrote these recipes that we have. Okay, so Oliver Wendell Petrie was born November 18th, 1899, in the town of Oswego, right here. Uh, this is a look of Oswego in the early 1900s, so a little bit after Oliver was born, but not that much different. This would have been the town uh, he, he grew up in, more or less. Um, so he was born in the town of Oswego. Soon after, though, his family moved into the city. He was one of at least eight children. Um, his brother Fletcher is going to come up later in this program. Uh, he's kind of important. Um, not much is known about his parents. We know that his mother's maiden name was Engel, uh, and she was evidently an avid reader because Oliver's full name is uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Petrie. Uh, he's named after this man, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., uh, who wrote a number of uh, influential books, in, or very popular at least, books in the late 1800s. The Breakfast Table series, they're known as. Um, he became very famous for this. He was also a scientist, a doctor, an inventor, all that. Uh, I'm fairly confident uh, Oliver was named after this Oliver Wendell Holmes, not his probably more famous son, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., who was a Supreme Court Justice for like 30 years. Uh, in 1899, when Oliver was born, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. was on the Supreme Court of Massachusetts. So unless, unless Miss Petrie was a very uh, avid jurist, uh, probably didn't know who Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. was, but I needed to include that awesome mustache in here somehow. So, there he is. Um, but back to Oswego. Uh, we also know about Oliver's childhood. It was a bit troubled. His father had a, a drinking problem, and he abandoned the family sometime when Oliver was in his teens. Uh, which unfortunately caused Oliver, he had to drop out of high school in order to help support his mother and the rest of his family. Uh, this is going to have a really profound impact, I, I think, on Oliver uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, this is when uh, what seems to be a very great worth e work ethic develops in him. And also, uh, I think from looking at his father's example in large part, uh, he abstains from alcohol for the rest of his life, which those of us who know canalers know that is a very rare trait on the old Erie Canal. Uh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to play into our story of Oliver on the canal as well. Um, but other than that, we don't know a ton about what was going on in his, in his life. Um, until 1929. Uh, interestingly, I, one thing I really want to know about Oliver's life is what he was doing uh, in 1917, 1918. He would have been about 20 years old when World War I was happening. But sadly, we don't know anything about uh, how he was involved or not involved in that. But anyway, uh, moving forward to uh, 1929, he falls in love with a girl named Helen Campney, uh, and they get married in 1929. Helen, not much is known about her life other than she was born in the city of Oswego, and like Oliver, had to drop out of high school um, to work, uh, as Lois said, in a woolen mill. Um, this is a woolen mill I was able to find an image of in the area. This is the American Woolen Mills in Fulton, New York, which is right up the Oswego River from Oswego. I don't know if this is the exact mill Helen would have been working at, but it's a possibility. Um, and together, Helen and Oliver would have three children, Bob, Phyllis, and Lois. Uh, Bob and Phyllis were both born 
before Oliver began his time on the canals, and they come up a lot in his letters. Um, and they all lived right here in Oswego, again. Um, now we get to the canals. We don't know when exactly Oliver, how, how it came to be that Oliver ended up working on a canal barge. Um, but here we have um, his union booklet from the International Brotherhood of Boilermakers, Iron Shipbuilders, and Helpers of America. As you can see here, Oliver was a helper, uh, which is probably a pretty broad definition. And he's going to end up as a cook on these on uh, these voyages he's going to take. Um, he's hired by the Federal Motor Ship Company. We know that. That's the company he worked for on three of the four voyages he was on. Um, and yeah, he had to join the Union in, in July. July 14th, the age of 38. Um, and on... He's not going to set out immediately in July, though, which is really interesting. It's not until, actually... His birthday, on November 18th, 1837, he begins his first voyage aboard this barge, the Empire State. As you can see up here, I would like to give a great shout out to the historical collections of the Great Lakes at Bowling Green State University. Um, they, I would know nothing about the Empire State were it not for them. Uh, these barges are very hard to track down. But thanks to them, uh, we do know that the Empire State was 244 and a half feet long, uh, 43 and a half feet wide, uh, which is just large enough to fit inside of a modern barge canal lock. Um, and this, this barge, it was an oil barge, made of steel, it could carry 1,355 tons of oil. Uh, those of you who follow the Erie Canal regularly, you might be more familiar with, um, with enlarged Erie Canal boats. Those could carry about 100 to 120 tons of goods. So the barge canal, as you can see, allowed boats to carry more than 10 times how much boats had previously been carrying on New York State canals. That's how they were able to compete with um, with railroads. This boat um, was built in 1929 up at the St. Lawrence uh, shipyards in Ogdensburg. Um, it's owned by the Federal Motor Ship Corporation for most of the time. At some point, it gets renamed the Buckeye State, uh, which checks out um, the Federal Motor Ship Corp. For some reason, they like to name their boats after state nicknames. There's another boat called the Badger State. Um, and Bowling Green identifies that it was supposedly the Empire State was bought in 1952 by a group of Honduran investors. Uh, who then later scrapped it a few years later. But I'm not sure if that's totally correct, uh, because also in our archives is this newspaper clipping uh, showing the Buckeye peeking at Oswego. Uh, based on the, the back of this clipping, it appears that this article was produced in the late 1970s, so maybe the Empire State was still prowling the waters. But if it was, uh, it would have had serious modifications over this boat that we see here. Uh, but just a thought. And Helen, uh, I believe this is her handwriting here, uh, identified this boat as the Empire State. Who knows, though? Let's look at the, the voyage of the Empire State. Oliver's first, first trip aboard a canal barge. Uh, they set out from Oswego, like I said, November 18th, Oliver's birthday, 
and he writes his first ever letter. He even says it in the letter that this is the first time he's ever written Helen a letter uh, on November 20th, two days in, while he's on Lake Erie, headed for Detroit. Uh, he was very impressed by this canal, the Welland Canal. Uh, we see here this flight of locks. Uh, the Welland Canal connects Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. It bypasses the Niagara River. Uh, these locks, which he was amazed by, they raise 75 feet each. So we're always impressed by the Lockport locks, which raised about 90 feet. This, this flight of locks in Thorold, Ontario, are they're even bigger than, than those locks. So very impressive. Um, and yes, thank you to, uh, to the Canal Society of New York for these, these great images. Um, their collection is stored at the Erie Canal Museum. Um, oh, I forgot to say, uh, from my discussion with Lois uh, in March, uh, the, the Empire State also has a crew of about six to seven men on board. Um, so back to the voyage. She passes through the Welland Canal uh, meaning that the, the Empire State would have taken the Lake Ontario route instead of going through the Barge Canal in the western part of New York State, uh, then goes to the Welland. Uh, in his letter, he mentions that they hope to get to Detroit by, by the next morning. However, there are snowstorms on Lake Erie. Many of you might have noticed that this, this trip begins very late in the canaling season. Um, and for anyone who's listened to Gordon Lightfoot before, you know the dangers of traveling on the Great Lakes in, in November. And it appears that the, the witches of November had come a calling. Uh, there's a snowstorm on Lake Erie. Oliver doesn't know if they're going to make it to Detroit in time. He hopes they do. Uh, but they might have to find a, a safe harbor for the night. Uh, which is pretty pretty interesting uh, to actually read a uh, first-hand account about these these Great Lake snowstorms. Uh, also, yes, on the Great Lake they call Gitchagumi, um, but this isn't Lake Superior. Um, anyway, uh, they needed, he also in the letter, he writes to Helen that he needs a her to go immediately to the uh, wherever they, I think the hospital, and get him a birth certificate because um, after they go through Detroit, they're going to carry on into Chicago, um, which that's really interesting that he's going to Chicago. Um, I know from Lois's recollections and from, she, she knew he went from Detroit to New York City, which is the route that we believe he definitely took. Other than that, it's not 100% sure where he would have gone. Uh, from the letter, we can glean he went to Chicago on his first voyage, but who knows if he went to other places on the Great Lakes or the coast. Um, his discharge book is very vague about destinations that just say Great Lakes and coast. Um, in his recipe book, I think I may have found a hint that he might have gone as far as Baltimore on the East Coast, but that's that's not, it just mentions Baltimore once. Who knows? It might have been an ingredient um, or well, something along those lines. So I'm not going to say that. But anyway, um, he's not going to get off in Detroit. He's going to Chicago where he needs his, to get his Siemens book. Uh, so he tells Helen to get him a, a birth certificate and send it on to him in Chicago. Evidently, uh, government worked much faster in the, 1930s because uh, he was like the day you receive this letter please um please just go get me a a birth certificate um hey who knows uh that that, that might have been easier said than done uh, but I wanted to share this other cool image. He didn't get off in Detroit this time, but there's no doubt he went off in Detroit. And I, I have discovered in my own personal collections a relatively contemporary image of Detroit. Um, here it is. 
This is a photo of the Detroit Tigers Stadium, taken in about 1946, I believe, uh, by my own grandfather uh, as he was returning home from World War II. And World War II is going to play a pretty big role in this whole story. And I love baseball, and I love my grandpa, so I wanted to I wanted to toss this in there. And uh, it is the the 75th anniversary of VD, VE Day was last weekend, so should give a shout out to all of our great World War II vets. Um, but moving on, uh, back onto the Empire State. Um, so like I said, Oliver served as a cook. However, if you look at his discharge book, he is listed as a second cook. And in his first letter, he talks about the, the head cook on the Empire State. Uh, it might be that Oliver was serving almost an apprenticeship on board the Empire State. Because like I said, we have no idea what experience Oliver had, either in seamanship or as a cook, before he enters service on, on the barge canal and the Empire State. So who, who knows? Um, there's a, the, the cook is described, however, as a swell fellow. Um, so, they, they got along well, and he seems to have learned a lot. Um, and unfortunately, we do not have any more letters from Oliver until his final voyage. Um, but he is going to finish this voyage on the Empire State. It's a very short one. Uh, it ends... December 18th, 1837, which makes sense. Uh, like we said, he starts this voyage relatively late in the canal season, and um, so he's only on the he's only on the water for about a month. He's going to take two more trips on the Empire State. Uh, the next year, he's going to start earlier, uh, September 3rd, 1839. That voyage will last until December 7th, 1938, um, and then his next voyage and his last voyage on the Empire State is going to be April 21st, 1939 to May 19th, 1939. Then, we're going to get to it later, he's going to be transferred to another ship, I believe, as their head cook. Uh, so he serves this kind of two-year apprenticeship, learning the ropes. Um, so let's learn a little about what he did learn. Okay, here's here's one of the recipes of Oliver's. This is his recipe for chili con carne, and his recipe book really shows us a lot about about the history of food, kind of in this era, um, and we can break this down into a lot of ways. Um, for one, you'll see in all of these, he must have been using a wood stove. There are no exact measurements, no exact times, like heats. Uh, there are exact measurements I'm just talking about for like cooking. He doesn't give you generally times for how long you're supposed to put it in. You can see you're supposed to brown it in the oven not an exact exact time as you can see and there isn't a heat other um other recipes some of you may have seen the erie canal museum's new series cooking on the canals which uses these recipes uh, which we will be putting out on fridays uh now and again here so you have that to look forward to uh also i'd like to give a plug to the baking lesson we made for elementary kids if you know any younger kids you can teach them math and history at the same time with oliver's great brownie recipe um but anyway back to this recipe um clearly had a wood stove on the on the boat uh you can also see he has things uh, from my discussions with lois he would pick up all of his ingredients in new york city at one specific store uh Based on his letters, he would occasionally stop in at other places to pick up groceries. 
But if he was picking up all of his food in bulk, there are some things like this, this one pound of hamburger, that could not have kept on these long voyages he would have been taking between Detroit and New York City, uh, which indicates he must have had some kind of way to refrigerate his food. Uh, the traditional way is the ice box, but I think it is entirely possible that Oliver may have had something resembling a modern day refrigerator uh, on board the, the, the Empire State. Uh, you see Frigidaire introduced what is essentially the modern refrigerator in 1923. Freon becomes very popular as the as that decade progresses, and by the 1930s, they were starting to become somewhat common household items. Uh, so I think a uh, oil corporation like the Federal Motor Ship Company was, it's very possible they, by the late 1930s, would be able to outfit their ships with this relatively new technology. I don't know, though. That's somewhat... All right, sorry about that, folks. Um, I don't really know what happened there. Um, my internet just cut out, which was lovely. It was great timing. Um, again, sorry about that. Um, but anyway, um, I, was, I was just about to start talking. Luckily, on the last broadcast, uh, Al Williamson brought up um, how they could have canned the meat. And I wanted to look a little at um, food canning processes. Uh, that kind of begins in the Napoleonic era. Um, when there's these large armies moving around that need to be fed. Um, Yeah, sorry, sorry, folks, if I'm a bit unenthusiastic at the moment. <laughs> um, anyway, um, uh, where am I? Yeah, so there's these large armies that need to move around in the Napoleonic era. Um, and that's when they start inventing ways to can food and preserve it better. Um, and it really hits its stride around the Civil War. Um when, again, large armies that need to move around with preserved food. So they start canning food. Ah, okay, there we go. We're getting some people back. Uh, please, if you can, tell the other stream, like, come on over here. Um, where was I? So anyway, uh, late 1800s canning really takes off. And by 1904, the modern uh, can that, that we're aware of today uh, is, is patented, how to make that sort of can in 1904. Um, don't ask me how that happens. I'm no expert on canning, just wanted to talk about that. And uh, you can see by the late 1930s, these sorts of tin cans are very, very common in the United States. Um, Okay, sorry, I've been throwing a bit off my game, but we, we will persevere. Uh, you can also see in this, uh, Oliver describes his style of cooking in his letters as cooking home style. Uh, so what he, what you would find at home, how you would cook at home. And in his, um, in his recipe book, you find some really interesting stuff. America in the early 20th century is really starting to expand its diet. Um, Oliver specialized in soups and stews, and we get a lot of these traditional just like beef stew recipes. Um, but we also, as we can see with this chili con carne recipe, we're starting to see the influence of immigrants on the, the United States food culture. 
uh, with this chili con carne. He also has things, as I mentioned in the article um, that we published on Monday. Um, he has Hungarian goulash, chop suey, and there's a number of other things, but I can only write so many things. But I wanted to look a little at how some of these foods were getting... How, how did Oliver find out about chili con carne, a Mexican dish? How did he find out about Hungarian goulash? So let's take a look. Um, chili is really popularized here. Uh, chili obviously is from Mexico originally. Uh, they started creating chili con carne hundreds of years ago in, uh, in the Spanish colonies of Mexico. Uh, once things like beef and pork are introduced to the new world. Um, eventually it migrates up into, into Texas with Mexican immigrants to Texas, uh, especially in Southern Texas and San Antonio specifically. So when this event happens, this is the 19, I mean, whoop, sorry, 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago. It is a massive event. Um, this this event has lots of big historical implications. It's at this that Frederick Jackson Turner first proposes his frontier theory uh, about America. Uh, it sees the first Ferris wheel uh, in food history itself. It's huge. Remember we talked about brownies earlier? Those were invented for the Columbian Exposition uh, at a hotel. Um, cream of wheat and Quaker oats and Aunt Jemima pancakes and juicy fruit gum all make their debut at this giant event. Um, Milton Hershey sees a chocolate machine, chocolate making machine, and he gets the idea he should invest in one of those. He's obviously going to create Hershey. Um, also, there's a tiny little, well, I don't know if they were tiny at the time, but uh, there's a tiny brewery in Milwaukee um, that wins the Best in Show Award at this at this exposition. Um, they win a blue ribbon for having the best beer. Uh, that brewery is Pabst, so that's where you get the uh, Pabst Blue Ribbon from. But it's also where Texas has has their own booth at this this exposition, and they have a San Antonio section where they serve chili, and everybody at the fair loves chili con carne uh, from the San Antonio people. And it really spreads to the Midwest originally. It becomes super popular. In the 1920s, there's tons of chili houses dotting the entire Midwest uh, as they move out from, from the Chicago World Fair. Well, Columbian Exposition. Um, and yes, as this comment says, thank you to the Library of Congress. They have lots of great images of this, uh, this event. There's also even uh, one of the buildings here still exists and houses the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry, I want to say. Don't quote me on that, but it does host a museum. Um, so there's chili for you. Um, it's very popular by this point, so people can find it um, pretty easily. Um, by the time of Oliver's, it's become a national national food. Uh, similarly, we have here, uh, this is uh, Song Ying Lo, the finest chop suey house in Chicago. Chop suey, the origins of it are a bit shrouded in mystery. We do know, however, that it was created by Chinese American immigrants in California. Um, it has kind of origins in uh, in some other Chinese uh, dishes, um, but that also took takes off in the late 1800s, uh, around the 1870s, 1880s. It's big, and you can see by this this stereopticon image is from uh, 1903. I forgot. The inventor of the stereopticon many of us know from the 1800s, uh, which allows you to see 3D images, invented by Oliver's namesake, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. Uh, so that's a neat little fact that I forgot to forgot to even mention. Um, but so chop suey's taken off, and by 
by the 1930s, it's a very popular recipe all around the country. And then there's the goulash. Uh, we see here in 1920 a great parade of Hungarian Americans in Washington, D.C. Uh, they were evidently advocating for something pro pro-Hungarian, um, but they bring over their own ethnic cuisines, like goulash, uh, which began, which originated in Hungary. It was this shepherd's soup uh, in the ninth century. So Oliver was serving on board his, the Empire State and later the Tug Samson, uh, food that you can trace back over a thousand years, and also food from really, if you think about it, three different continents are all being prepared now on, on his boat, which shows the incredible, like we often think of the Erie Canal, this one, the famous towpath Erie Canal as cutting into the wilderness. And it also has these big Irish and German uh, influences on it. But now we can see in the 1930s, the Erie Canal is right at the heart of, of this new American experience, uh, American, uh, this heterogeneous society that, that these uh, cuisines really represent. Also, I wanted to state that Hungarian goulash, it's very telling that uh, Oliver labels it specifically in his um, recipe book as Hungarian goulash because it does differentiate it from um, American goulash, which was really invented in 1914. Uh, I didn't know this until I started researching it. American and Hungarian goulashes are pretty much not even close to the same dish other than that they have paprika in them and like beef is included. Um, so that's just an interesting little fact. Uh, also should be noted he has a lot of fish recipes and while much of his time was spent on lakes and canals, uh, most of the fish in his recipes are ocean going fish like cod. So just a little food for thought. He also has some other ethnic cuisines there like gefilte fish is one of his recipes. So that further shows this, uh, this mixing that goes on. Uh, so as the comment said, uh, you should check out the Tugboat Roundup. Um, and as I said earlier, um, Empire Oliver's gonna spend a couple voyages on the Empire State. But then, right after he gets off the Empire State, on May 19th, 1939, he is transferred over to the Tug Samson. Sadly, we have practically no information about the Tug Samson other than a lawsuit that exists from the 1940s where a man working on the Tug Samson had his uh, leg chopped off in a horrible accident, uh, in which he was suing the owner of the Tug Samson, the oil transfer company, over. So I, don't, I guess because Oliver probably was a union worker, uh, they would transfer you to different union shops uh, on the line is what I'm assuming. So he, he gets transferred over to the Tug Samson on May 20th, 1939. That's just the day after he leaves the Empire State. Uh, he boards that in Oswego. Uh, and he's going to be on that until August 5th, 1939. And this is where we know a ton about Oliver because this is where five of his six letters are from this Voyage, which is also going to be his last one. Uh, first thing he writes is on May 28th. It's a short little postcard. He has sent it from near somewhere near Rochester and asks Helen to go uh, get a book and give it to Fletcher, uh, his brother. This is a this is something that Lois also brought up in uh, my interview with her that. Fletcher, who owned a, a market in Oswego, would often go and meet Oliver at the locks in Mineto, which there they are. There's our lovely Mineto locks. 
um, take note of this area. It's actually going to be kind of important in um, the future in Oliver's life as well. Uh, but it shows you that a guy that you were totally alone on, on a ship, uh, one of these boats, when you were on the canal, people could easily visit you here at the locks, give you, give you books and several of his letters that he writes home. He always hopes he can get to these Minato locks and Oswego and spend some time on shore uh, with his family. Um, anyway, moving on um, to his next letter, which is a month later on June 15th. Uh, you can see that in addition to traveling on the Welland, Oswego, and Erie canals, he also was going a little bit on the Champlain canals. He ends up in Glens Falls, uh, and he's writing this letter from on the Hudson River, uh, which this is one of my, my favorite letters of his. Um, he talks about what Helen said, I mean, what Lo Lois said, was his favorite point on the canal. Uh, I mean, on the whole route that he took. Uh, right here, West Point. Uh, this is an actual postcard from West Point in 1939. So this is what Oliver could have been seeing, this scene from the Hudson River. Um, loved West Point. Uh, he said that passing by it, there was also a house up on a hill uh, that he said it was like passing by a dream castle. He said he could... It never got old passing by West Point, and West Point is a, a gorgeous, um, gorgeous area if you're ever down in the Hudson River. Um, he also notes, though, remember this is 1939. Um, in a few months, World War II is going to begin with Germany's invasion of Poland. So West Point was really ramping up. Uh, we see here, uh, this is a newspaper article, that the largest class ever in West Point history graduated in 1939, up to that point. I'm, I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty confident that even more uh, people graduated from West Point in the ensuing years. Uh, he says that the academy was like a, a city, more or less, um, at this time, preparing for World War II. Um, he also tells uh, a fun story in this letter about uh, how he gets in a bit of a miscommunication with a with a grocer in Troy who thinks he's on the Erie Canal. He's actually on the Champlain Canal, so he's out until like 2 in the morning, and the captain makes fun of him, uh, saying he's a, he's a night owl like everybody else on the crew, which, ah, here's a nice little picture of Oliver at home cooking. Um, he, he jokes around um, with Oliver that he's a night owl like everyone else. Uh, Oliver, as you remember, is a teetotaler, does not consume alcohol. Uh, so, as Lois said, his job generally whenever the, the boats landed in port, uh, when sailors do what sailors tend to do, which is go out drinking and carousing on shore uh, it was oliver's job oftentimes to go go help round these guys up and bring them back to the boat for the next day's voyage um but here he is out until 2 a.m and i would also like to note that uh one of lois's dreams she always she she told me about in her interview is that someone write a sea shanty called oliver the teetotaling sailor about uh, Oliver's unique life as a sailor who also abstained from alcohol. Very rare. Uh, and I, th I think it'd be fun. So the challenge has been issued to our crowd. Um, anyway, uh, on to his next letter written on June 19th. He writes it to the kids, says he cooks better on ship than he does at home. Um, which who knows? I, I mean, no one, no one would really know. You'd have to eat eat Oliver's cooking both at home and on boat. But Lois thinks that's fairly accurate. Um, this picture must have been taken on the weekends because she said the only time Oliver ever cooked at home was on the weekends, never weekdays. Helen was the was the main chef in the household. Um, anyway, so he talks a little about his cooking. 
also talks, since he's right into the kids, tells him he's going to go check out uh, when he gets down to New York. This, this is the 1939 World's Fair, which was held in Flushing Meadows uh, in Corona Park. Uh, started April 30th, 1939. Uh, this was a gigantic event. Um, the biggest the biggest event between the two world wars uh, that was put on. It was exceptionally expensive. It was the second largest World's Fair in history. Um, the other one being, I think, the 1904 Chicago World's Fair. Um, brings all these nations together. Um, it's to promote it. Uh, Howard Hughes, even. There's Howard Hughes. He has a, a flight around the world. He does it in 91 hours, which is a record. And his his plane is decorated with advertisements for this fair. Unfortunately, um, the World's Fair doesn't go that great because um, this, this lovely expression of, of world peace and brotherhood uh, is marred, uh, again, when... The Germans invade Poland and begin World War II. Uh, it's going to close much earlier than most World's Fairs in 1940. However, it does have this great distinction uh, because of the World's Fair. Uh, places like Poland and the United Kingdom had sent priceless artifacts to be on display in their pavilions, uh, which they decided it was much safer to leave those artifacts in the United States than to return them to Europe. Um, so, Howard Hughes, um, he is the big star of Oliver's next letter on June 25th, um, where Oliver actually sees Howard Hughes, sort of. He sees him land. Uh, Oliver sees this plane specifically. Uh, this is Sikorsky S-43. Um, which lands right in front of the Tug Simpson. Samson, excuse me. Um, this is a relatively rare, um, but you can actually see this Sikorsky in Fantasy of Flight. Oliver is not particularly impressed. Uh, he runs into the, the taxi driver who's supposed to pick up um, Howard Hughes. Uh, Howard Hughes in the late 1930s is one of the world's biggest stars. Um, in the letter, though, uh, he also runs into a guy who wants to get Howard Hughes' autograph, and he was like, to me, he's just another guy. Uh, so he, he did not stick around to see Howard Hughes. Uh, and as we all know, Howard Hughes is going to become famous uh, later during the war for trying to uh, own the Spruce Goose, uh, an even larger amphibious seaplane than this one. Uh, so that was a neat little thing. Also in this June 25th letter, uh, he really hopes that he can get back up to Oswego. He talks about how as, as a tug, they now no longer travel the Great Lakes much. They go mainly on inland waterways, um, pushing these empty and full oil barges back and forth. Um, and he hopes, he's supposed to, he explains how they're pushing an empty oil barge up the Hudson and then into the Erie Canal and hopes they can make it as far as Oswego before they meet another tug with a full oil tank that they then have to bring back down to New York City. Uh, so he's not going on these large voyages as much anymore. Um, and he's also starting to get really homesick. Um, and there's our tugboats. So these these are tugboats at the Waterford Tugboat Roundup that's usually held in September. Hopefully it'll be again this year. Um, these give you a sense of what these tugboats might have looked like. I don't think they've changed much since the 1930s, honestly. Um, he also tells a fun story in his last letter on June 27th. Um, where he again is talking about this oil transfer. Um, but also this fun little canal tale 
about the captain on the boat who uh, he had apparently ordered some supplies that weren't getting to him from the company, um, which had happened to him before. And his solution to that had been when the previous cook uh, on the boat had his stove had stopped working and the company wouldn't give him a new stove. Uh, they simply just put the, they tossed the stove overboard, essentially. Called the company, said that there had been a horrible accident where the stove fell off the boat, um, and they needed a new stove, which that got the company's attention, and uh, the the tugboat received their stove. That was, a, that was a fun tale. That was one that Oliver evidently told quite frequently um, in his days after the canals which we are approaching the end of his days on the canal. Like I said, this voyage is going to end uh, August 5th, 1939, uh, which is when the oil transfer company is going to ask him to serve overseas with the oil tankers uh, on probably an ocean-going vessel or possibly one in... Uh, it seems like a lot of these oil companies also had operations in uh, Central America, especially around Mexico. Uh, not totally sure where they wanted him to go overseas. Um, he probably made a smart choice of not opting to uh, to go overseas because it's shortly after this that World War II is going to begin and traveling by, uh, by ocean-going vessel became significantly more dangerous. And also he did not want to leave his family, who he loved very deeply. So he turns them down and uh, never really returns to the canals again so much. Um, he, he bounces around to a couple factories. Um, first, he works in FlexoWire, which was in uh, downtown Oswego, uh, before he settles here at Columbia Mills. That's here. Sorry that the image is really blurry. Not a, Interestingly, people didn't take a lot of pictures of this factory. Uh, but right here, these are those Minetto locks where he used to meet Fletcher uh, and get his books. So he, he was always right next to the canal pretty much his entire life. Um, but he works here at Columbia Mills for over 30 years. Here's some interesting images from the Library of Congress. Uh, Oliver is quite possibly in this crowd. Uh, this was the United Nations Day. Uh, also Flag Day in Oswego. Uh, this is a collection of veterans in 1943 from, we've got, uh, there's a Polish guy in here, a Yugoslavian, a British uh, army officer. People from all the allied nations are in this group uh, speaking to a group of factory workers who are doing invaluable wartime effort uh, themselves. Um, so there's several of these pictures in the Library of Congress's archives. Um, and uh, Columbia Mills made vinyl shading and vinyl products. So those had to have been important in wartime efforts at some point. Um, and he worked here at Columbia Mills for 30 years before finally retiring. Um, also, to make money... Uh, Oliver was the gladiolus king, essentially, of Oswego. He owned two and a half acres of this, which he and the rest of his family tilled for most of his life, and they were the main supplier to Oswego Flores of gladiolus, which, when I talked to, to Lois and she told me about this, I honestly didn't know what a gladiolus was, but now they are very pretty flowers, so... Uh, that was pretty cool uh, that he did that. Uh, the other big thing in his life was this. This was the Church of the Evangelists in uh, Oswego. Oliver was a very pious man. It also contributed to his teetotaling. Um, he was a, uh, a vestryman in the church, which from what I understand is like being on kind of the church board. Um, he sang bass in the choir. Helen played piano uh, here as well, accompanying them. Uh, and when he died in 1967, spoiler alert, um, he was actually writing a history of 
of the church. Um, so, like I said, he was a lifetime learner. Uh, in addition to, even though he he dropped out of, of high school, uh, Helen, I mean Lois, really wanted to to emphasize that, and he instilled this love of learning into the rest of his children as well. Uh, many of his descendants are involved in education uh, now. So, uh, so other interesting facts about Oliver. Uh, he never learned how to drive a car, uh, nor did Helen. So they, as, as Lois said, the only time they would take a taxi uh, twice a week, once to the grocery store, once to church. Um, he must have taken a bus or something to get to Columbia Mills, I assume, though it's possible he could have walked. Um, he loved classical music and, uh, and art. Um, like I said before, he cooked on weekends, um, which from my interview with Lois, the poor family, because um, apparently Helen was not much of a cook. Uh, her way, as Lois said, of knowing that uh, potatoes were done as if you could smell the smoke. Uh, but anyway, uh, he was he was a good cook. She particularly liked his chili con carne, which we looked at in depth there, and uh, and his tomato soup pie. Um, so, like I said, he's going to work at Columbia Mills for 30 years, uh, retire, and then sadly, in 1967, he passed away of a stroke. Uh, Helen would would survive him for 30 more years, uh, passing on in 1997. Um, yeah, but he left quite a rich legacy. Uh, I can tell from my interview with Lois, his only uh, surviving uh, child at this point. She really loved him. And um, the, the family has done great. Uh, he was seems like he was a great man. I would have loved to have met him at some point. Um, and now we know so much about his story thanks to this great um, donation to the museum. Um, so I would encourage you all, dear viewers, if you have any fun little canal-related things, you should look into donating stuff to the Erie Canal Museum. Uh, I would like to again thank the uh, Oliver's family for donating what they did to us. And if you know anything about Oliver Petri, please feel free to share it with us. Um, now I'll give us a little bit. Uh, are there any questions? No. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, especially to those of you who stayed stayed with us here. Uh, hmm. Bill Woolley's family grandparents on the Cayuga and Seneca Canal. Very interesting. My family also immigrated to, well, migrated to Minnesota. So, neat. Um, so, yeah, thank you again for watching, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next week, hopefully, sans the technical problems. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>